Hi, boys and girls. Today we're going to read a story. A read aloud is kind of a social studies assignment as well as a read aloud assignment. It is about a woman named Esther Morris. And the book is called I Could Do That. Esther Morris Gets the Women Gets Women to Vote. It is written by Linda Arms White, and the pictures are by Nancy Carpenter. The cool thing about this story is it's not a made-up story. This is actually based on a true story about a woman named Esther Morris. I want you to listen to the story about Esther Morris, and I want you to tell me, or be able to answer some of the questions that I've written for you at the end. So let's just go ahead and follow along and listen to the story of Esther Morris and um, how she gets women to vote. You already kind of know what it is that she does, right? That's going to be one of your questions. In 1820, so this is 200 years ago, six-year-old Esther McQuig studied her mother making tea. I could do that, she said. Make tea? asked Mama. The older girls do that. But I want to learn, said Esther, and she did. She pumped water into the kettle and set it on the wood stove to boil. She scooped tea leaves into the teapot, then poured steaming water over them. Esther strained the tea into cups, one for her mother, one for herself. As they sat near the window of their New York house, Esther saw men riding by in their best suits, some carrying flags. Where are those men going, Mama? asked Esther. They're going to vote for the next president of the United States, Mama said. Will Papa vote? Yes, Papa always votes. Will you vote, Mama? No, dear. Only men can vote. So 200 years ago, only men could vote in our country. Hmm. When Esther was eight, she watched her mother sew a fine seam. The needle pulled thread in and out, in and out, tracking tiny even stitches across the fabric. Esther felt her hands mimicking her mother's. I could do that, she said, and she did. She made clo clothes for her dolls from scraps, and when her stitches became neat and straight, she sewed a shirt for Papa. Here she's making her dad a shirt, too. And there's her doll with a dress that she made for her doll. When Esther was 11, five years later, her mother died. And for the first time, she saw her father cry. He gathered his 11 children together. I don't know what we'll do without your mama, he said. I'm depending on each of you to be brave and take care of one another. Esther, eighth of the eleven, cried too. But then she said, I can do that, Papa. And she did. Notice what is she doing already to take care of them. So she's using what she knows to help out when she can. Hmm. I think there's a lesson there. When Esther was 19, six feet tall and on her own, she earned a living making dresses with leg of mutton sleeves for society ladies. That's leg of mutton. It's got that big poofy thing in it. When the ladies wanted hats to match the dresses, Esther designed and made those too. Soon, she thought of opening, opening a millinery shop. Now that makes me think, what in the world is a millinery shop? You are much too young to run a business, she was told. I don't see why, was Esther's reply. And with that, she opened a hat shop in Owego, New York. Ah, so a millinery shop must be a shop that makes hats. So she's making her own hats, and she's, she's young. She's only 18 years old, or 19 years old. And everybody said, you can't do that, you're too young. Esther started attending abolitionist meetings at her church, but a throng of people who believed in the right to own slaves 
threatened to stop the meetings, even if they had to tear down the Baptist church where they were held. You can't do that, said Esther. I'll stop anyone who tries. And it looks like she did. I like the picture here. She puts, she's got her hand on this guy's head. All the people are hiding in the church. This guy's ready to fight her. Looks like he's half her size. This guy's falling off his horse. This guy's lighting this guy's hat on fire. You got this guy over here poking him, getting poked in the belly with the cane. Who knocks this guy in the nose and starts this guy's tail on fire. <laughs> kind of funny. I like Esther. She's got fire. She's got spunk. When Esther was 28, she married Artemis Slack. And a few years later, had a son they called Archie. But when Artemis died in an accident, Esther made a big decision. I'm moving to Illinois, she told her friends. I'll claim the land Artemis owned there and raise our son. You can't do that, her friends cried. Illinois is the very edge of civilization. It's full of dangerous people and wild animals. Yes, she said, I can. And that was that. So there she goes, off and riding again. This, this woman can't be told nothing, can she? Don't tell Esther not to do it. She'll do it for sure then. So at that time in our country's history, Illinois was on the edge of the states that had been claimed and become part of our country. So she's taking off and she's starting her, starting her own life on the very edge of the country where there's wild animals and wild people. And everybody said, oh, a woman can't go and do that. And looks like she doesn't listen, does she? I like this picture down here. You got the little baby crawling out of the tub. In Illinois, she fought long and hard to claim Artemis's land, but was denied her inheritance because she was female. So her husband had bought land there, but they wouldn't let her keep it because she was a woman. That doesn't sound very fair. Esther met and married John Morris, a merchant and immigrant from Poland. In 1851, she gave birth to twin boys, Edward and Robert, but John had a hard time making a living. So while Esther raised the children, cooked the meals, and washed the clothes, she helped earn the money, too. When Esther was 46, she went with John to the presidential election polls and watched through the window while he voted. You know, she told him when he came out, I could do that. Politics is the business of men, my dear, he said. Humph, <clears throat> said Esther. It's our country, too. When war broke out between the northern and the southern states, Esther was proud that Archie joined the victorious fight of the North to end slavery. Soon after an amendment to the Constitution granted Negro men all rights of citizenship, including the right to vote. So now even the black men who had once been slaves had been given the right to vote, but women still could not. When Esther heard Susan B. Anthony speaking out about women's rights, Esther began to hope that someday women might vote too. Okay. So Susan B. Anthony was a very famous woman who tried to get women across the country the right to vote. Interesting to look her up and see what you can learn about her. Maybe you should do that when we're done with the story. In 1869, when Esther was 55, she and her 18-year-old son, our sons moved to the newly formed Wyoming Territory, where John and Archie, who had gone there the year before, waited. Esther and the boys traveled by train across miles of prairie, then by stage over rocky hills to South Pass City, a dusty, hurriedly built town where gold had, had been found. Most of the 2,000 people who lived there were rowdy young men. They worked in the mines by day and drank in the saloons by night. They don't look like very good guys, do they? <laughs> Fighting and drinking and shooting. The Morrises moved their belongings into a small log cabin. 
and South Pass City became home. John ran a saloon. A saloon is like a bar. Archie bought a printing press and started a newspaper. That's her son, Archie. Esther opened a hat shop. <laughs> she, she knows what she like, she's good at, and she keeps doing it to make money. But with six men and to every woman, there was always a need for someone to nurse the sick and wounded, sew clothes, help deliver babies, and give motherly advice to the few young women in town. I could do that, Esther said, and she did. One day, Esther read a proclamation tacked to a wall. There it is right there. All male citizens, 21 and older, are called to vote in the first territorial elections. Esther looked around at the disorderly young men. It's time I did that, she said. So she's tired of all these drunk, goofy men fighting and running around the town, acting all all stupid. And she's thinking, if those men can vote, those drunk, stupid men can vote, why can't women? Esther's sons watched her march toward home. They knew it was more likely that things were about to change than that things would stay the same. Esther invited the two men running for the territorial legislature to her house to speak to the citizens. Then she sent out invitations to the most influential people in the territory. Come for tea and talk to the candidates. She scrubbed her tiny home from top to bottom, washed the curtains, and ironed her best dress. What do you think she's going to do? What is she up to? When the, when the candidates and the guests arrived, Esther served them all tea. One thing I like about Wyoming, she said, is how everyone is important. It takes all of us to run the town, women as well as men. Yes, yes, her guests agreed. And it's a place where people aren't afraid to try new things. Her guests, oh, yeah, yeah, they all agreed again. Yeah, look at their, oh, yeah, she's, makes, she's a smart girl. She makes a lot of sense and good tea. Mm, yeah. Esther smiled. She turned to the candidates. Then, would you, if elected, introduce a bill in the legislature that would allow women to vote? Suddenly, in that tiny room full of people, not a sound was heard. They're thinking, oh boy, I don't know, not women, I don't think I'm going to be, maybe not, no, no one wants to speak, they're all afraid to say anything. But she's got them, doesn't she? They all agreed that, oh yeah, this is a place where we're not afraid to try new things. Finally, Colonel William Bright spoke. Mrs. Morris, my wife would like to vote too. She is intelligent and well-educated. Truth be told, she would be more in, a more informed voter than I. If I am elected, I will introduce that bill. Not wanting to be outdone, the other candidate, Herman Nickerson, also agreed. Applause broke out in that tiny cabin and Esther dropped to her chair. Thank you, she said. People warned her that once the bill was introduced, the men of the legislature would have to approve it, and the governor would have to sign it. This had never happened anywhere, not in the whole country. Why did she think that it would happen here? But Esther had seen things that were not likely to happen, happened every day. She wrote letters and visited legislatures to make sure that this bill would happen too. So she's trying to put pressure on these guys who said that they would do this, that, hey, you, you said you were going to do this. Women in this territory should have the right to vote. And it did. On December 10th, 1869, Governor John Campbell signed this bill into law. Wyoming women get the vote. Women across the country rejoiced for the women of Wyoming. Yeehaw! Yippee! 
Hurrah, hurrah. Everybody, all the women are celebrating. They were the first women in the whole country to get to write the vote. And it was all because of Esther Morris. But some people didn't like it. Look at this grumpy guy. What's he got in his hand there? Some people didn't like it. Only eight days later, Judge James Stillman, the county's justice of the peace, that's a judge, turned in his resignation. He refused to administer justice in a place where women helped make the laws. Word went out that a new justice of the peace was needed. Esther's boys turned to her. Mama, you could do that, they said. And so she applied. Archie, then the clerk of the court, proudly swore his mother in, making Judge Esther Morris the first woman in the country to hold public office. Wow. She was the first one in the whole United States to hold a public office as a judge or any other position. But Judge Stillman refused to turn over the official court docket to Esther. Never mind, she said. Archie, Will you please go to the mercantile, that's a store, and buy me a ledger? I'll start my own docket. And of course, she did. A ledger is like a big official notebook that you wrote down all the, all the records of what was going on and what was happening. So she said, fine, you won't give, you, you crabby old judge, you won't give me the ledger, I'll start my own. On September 6, 1870, one year after her tea party, Judge Esther Morris put on her best dress and walked with her husband, John, and her sons down the dusty street to the polling place. That's where you vote. She would be one of a thousand Wyoming women voting that day, the first ever given the right, given that right permanently by any governing body in the United States. As they walked, John, who still didn't think that women should vote, tried to coach her on which candidates and issues she should vote for. So her husband is still saying, oh, honey, you know, you should really vote for this guy, or you should vote for that guy, or you should vote for this person or that person. <laughs> How do you think Esther feels about that? She thinks she's going to listen to her husband? Esther held up her hand. I can do this, she said. And she did. So it took a long time. It took her almost her whole life to get women the right to vote. And that was only in the state of Wyoming. None of the other territories or states in the country yet had passed a law that said women had the right to vote. I'm going to read the author's note quick, too. Only the barest facts from church, cemetery, and public records are known about Esther Morris, Morris's life, her millinery businesses, and her two marriages. Esther's church in Owego was the first anti-slavery church in the country. Her interest in equal rights extended to women's suffrage as recorded in letters to her cousin. It is said that in 1895, Esther attended the National Suffrage Convention as an elected delegate. While many historians believe that the story of her tea party is true, as Captain H.G. Nickerson, one of the candidates, reported some years later, others question whether it really happened at all. All, however, agree that Esther was instrumental in gaining women, women's suffrage in Wyoming territory. They also agree that when her son swore her in as Justice of the Peace in South Pass City, she became the first female judge and the first woman in the United States to hold a political office. In spite of all her firsts, Esther never voted for president. It wasn't until 1920, 51 years after Esther's Wyoming Tea Party, and 18 years after she died, that the 19th Amendment to the Constitution granted all women across the country and the United States the right to vote in national elections. Esther's likeness still stands in front of the Wyoming State Capitol and in the National Statutory Hall collection in the United States Capitol. 
Today, women throughout much of the world vote, hold office, and take an active role in their country's government. However, there are still some countries where women's voices are not heard. If Esther were, he were there, she would get out her teapot and get to work. Very cool. And then in the back, all these teapots show the, the years that all of the states. It says, Esther Morris brewed a pot of tea that heated up women's suffrage movement and won the vote for women of Wyoming Territory in 1869. Gradually, more territories and states gave women the right to vote. See if I can find Minnesota on here. I don't see Minnesota. They did get the right to vote, but it might not have been until later. There's a bunch of them there. So I hope you enjoyed the story. Now I want you to click on the add response button, and I want you to fill out some questions that I, that I have for you about our story. Thanks for listening.